Hi, everyone. This is Steve Warnick, Reb Steve, one of the rabbis at Beth Sedek Congregation in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, coming to you 1230 Monday. It's Conversations Over Coffee. Uh, I apologize that today is not live. We are recording it for whatever reasons. We had difficulty uh, going live uh, to uh, both Facebook and to YouTube. Uh, but Jack and I are talking live. So that's good enough. We're both, you know, breathing as we're speaking to each other. Uh, Today's guest is uh, my, my friend, former president of Beth Sedek Congregation and a retired uh, justice of, um, of Ontario, uh, the Honorable Jack Grossman uh, retired, who just published a memoir as a lawyer and a judge book called Decisions. Uh, Jack, so good to, it's always good to see you. It's especially wonderful to be in a conversation with you um, about your new book and about your memoirs. Um, let's start with, you know, from the, even from the very beginning, what, what inspires you to pursue a career in, in law? Uh, why did you become a lawyer? Well, first of all, Rabbi, I want to thank you uh, for the privilege of sharing this moment with you and with members of our shul on your popular program. This is this is not the first time that I am having a conversation with my rabbi, but I think it's probably the first time that we won't have to make any decisions. Right. <laughs> so I am delighted to share this with you. Uh, what prompted me to consider law? It started, I suppose, in high school when I was uh, a president of our debating team and uh, went on to uh, engage in conversations and uh, follow um, cases. And it was something that drew my interest immediately. Uh, and as I progressed through university, it continued to develop. And of course, eventually into Osgoode Hall, a uh, bar admission course and into practice. And I spent 28 years as a lawyer downtown in a general practice with an emphasis on criminal law. And uh, I look back as I write this book, and it's an opportunity for me to reminisce and go back over a trip down memory lane. So it really started, I suppose, in high school when I started to develop that interest in the law, um, in politics, of which many lawyers were a part at the time and um, the debating that I had in high school. Um, I, I um, am working my way through the book. I've, I've skimmed it. I haven't yet read it. Um, what, what went into, you know, as, considering how long your career was, um, both as, uh, um, both as a, uh, a lawyer and as a judge, um, what, were, what were the criteria by which you selected which cases you were going to um, include in the book? I was fortunate that I saved a number of my files when I practiced as a lawyer, the more interesting cases. I also saved over 200 written judgments um, as a judge. So I was able to resort back for decades to the interesting cases that I dealt with and have the exact details and accuracy so that everything in my book is true, even to the point of one file having a reference to the weather that day. So I divided my book into half. The first year, half, my lawyer years. Second half, my judge years. I looked at the files that I had saved. I organized chapters. In fact, there were moments, you know, when I recall waking in the middle of the night with an idea and I would scribble it down and go back to sleep. I would be on the Don Valley Parkway and think of an idea, pull off and park, scribble it down. And I enjoyed writing this book. I, I didn't write this for me. I lived it. I wrote it for others, for my children, for my grandchildren. And I was used to late nights at the office preparing cases as a lawyer. I was used to late nights at home writing judgments as a judge. So now I was writing all about it. And it was a pleasure as I reminisced. 
did you uncover um did you uncover you know things that surprised you uh about yourself as you were doing this was was there was there things that you you learned um in writing this memoir that um you know perhaps things that you conclusions that you came to decisions that you made uh that um uh you know where the the, the process you know while you were going through it you know, wasn't as meaningful as perhaps the reflection? Um, well, I look back now and I, I think of some of the experiences I had and the challenges that I had to face. And I, I can't believe how I was able to deal with some of them difficult clients or difficult judges uh, that I appeared before. Uh, the challenge of operating my law practice of trying to balance getting the work done. And I was a stickler for detail. I, I wouldn't leave anything out. And as a result, it prolonged my hours in the office. And I had to balance that with my devotion to my wife, my children being at home. So when I look back now, I realize how difficult that was. And somehow I managed to address it and overcome it and realize that you know, as I said in my book, decisions are not just made in the courtroom. Decisions are made all through life. Uh, from when we're little kids in public school and we decide, do we want the red gumball or the green gumball? Uh, which uh, subjects are we going to study in high school? Who am I going to take to the prom? Uh, which university am I going to enroll in? Throughout life, we're faced with decisions. And as I look through that book now and reread what I wrote, I realize that life is full of that. And I managed somehow to survive the difficulties and the challenges of making those decisions. So I, I want to ask you about uh, about some of those decisions, uh, especially one of the uh, um, seems you know, more outlandish and interesting of your cases, which is when you uh, represented a chimpanzee. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when I think back, there, there were two experiences in my life with monkey business. One was <laughs> representing the owner of Heidi, the chimpanzee, charged with criminal negligence causing bodily harm. The only other monkey business that I could recall was monkey business that periodically appeared on the Shul Board of Governors. But um, <laughs> those are my monkey business experiences. Uh, the monkey that I represented, so to speak, takes up two chapters in the book. So I certainly can't go into it in depth, but suffice it to say that uh, this man approached me to help him with his chimpanzee who had uh, scratched a young child and he was charged with criminal negligence. And then I began to learn that this chimpanzee, if you will, with a 53 inch chest was capable of driving a motor vehicle and was seen to drive a motor vehicle down Queen Street, enjoyed a cigarette with its owner performed in various um, areas such as Madison Square Gardens, Maple Leaf Gardens, and the like, and was a very talented animal until it began to show signs of returning to the wild. And it became a very interesting case. And those who read the book will see how it unraveled before Judge Weisberg, Sikronoli um, Raha at the time, and uh, eventually was resolved. Um, when you became uh, a judge, um, how did your experience as an attorney um, impact your behavior on, on the bench? I should say a lawyer, because I know we're in Canada. <laughs> so how, how, did your, uh, how did your experience as a, as a lawyer impact your behavior on the bench? I used my experience as a lawyer to determine how I would want lawyers to feel about me on the bench. I always wanted to know that whether I won or lost a case, I had a fair hearing. 
And so it wasn't so much knowing the knowledge of the law. You could always look it up. You could always do research. You could always have your research assistants to assist you. The important qualities that I chose as a judge from my lawyer days were primarily the ability to listen, the ability to be fair and to be respectful of counsel, to have patience, to have compassion. Um, and uh, the root of Rachmanus, as you know, Rechem is the womb of a woman. Uh, just as a woman would have compassion for her child, you have to have compassion because everyone who appeared before me be they lawyers, crown attorneys, or accused, witnesses, everyone, was someone's child. So it's important to be effective, to be diligent, but always reasonable and impartial. And to me, compassion and empathy were important. And that's what I wanted as a lawyer. When I appeared before a judge, that's what I hoped I was as a judge. So a lot of people struggle with impartiality. Um, how how does one how does one strive to be impartial uh, and to keep their their personal views and opinions uh, to the side when when doing this kind of work? Because you have an obligation, an obligation to everyone who appears in front of you, as I said, to listen to them, and perhaps you may have your personal beliefs but you still have to apply the law. And in our system, there is a presumption of innocence. The Crown has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Even if I felt someone was probably guilty, even if I didn't like the person who appeared before me for a variety of reasons, you still had that obligation to apply the law. I can tell you, and there were cases that I even put in the book, I felt that they were guilty, but the crown had not satisfied its burden. And when that happens, you acquit. Uh, Supreme Court of Canada has come out with ruling after ruling on probable guilt is simply not enough. It must be guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So irrespective of my personal feelings, it's the application of the law that takes priority. When, when you reflect on some of the cases uh, when you were on the bench, um, especially the ones that are in the book, um, what are the cases that come out as being prime examples of those values that you, um, that you apply to your work? Well, hopefully all the cases result in the appropriate result, but people, people make mistakes and judges are human. Um, you know, when I decided to call my book Decision, um, as I said before, not just because of what's in the courtroom, but throughout life, what comes to mind is um, uh, the words of Rabbi Noah Weinberg, who was the founder of Aish HaTorah. And he said, people often avoid making decisions out of fear of making a mistake. Actually, the failure to make decisions is one of life's biggest mistakes. Mm -hmm. Out of the, the, the cases that you, uh, that you oversaw, which were the ones that had um, the most far-reaching impact on Canadian law itself? Well, I think dealing with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was always an issue where uh, many people within the community would have some difficulty. Uh, they, there was a presumption that if someone did what they did and they're guilty of it, you should find them guilty and couldn't understand why the case might not proceed because of a breach of a charter right. Uh, many times cases were uh, stopped because they were not tried within a reasonable time, which the charter guarantees or there may have been a breach of uh, search and seizure, uh, or a variety of uh, a right to counsel was not properly given. And those have always presented a challenge. Uh, I know in one of the cases that I uh, dealt with, um, I viewed it in a certain way, 
an appeal appellate court viewed it in a different way. It was a question of which line of cases you would follow. So there's always that um, struggle, that tension between the substantive law and the charter arguments. Uh, sometimes there can be technical issues. And ultimately, it's back to the same principle that a person that comes before you, irrespective of what the evidence is, until you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of their guilt, they are an innocent person. Who, who are your mentors? Oh, there are many mentors. And if I start to name them now, for sure, I'm likely going to walk down that minefield of forgetting to name <laughs> others. But I can tell you that um, there were many judges who I was not just fond of, but who set an example as the benchmark of what a good judge is. Uh, I was fortunate to have regional senior judges, um, associate chief judges, chief judges, all of whom uh, showed leadership capability, who were mentors. There were those who dedicated themselves to the law. And then again, there were those who were not what you would call an example of who I would look up to. But that has changed. The court has changed. From the 70s to now, you see a more um, academic-minded uh, bench, uh, very talented lawyers who apply the law appropriately, who have patience and listen to arguments, who give reasons for their decisions, who have made the Ontario Court of Justice the best court in the country because it administers law in a fair and decent fashion that is satisfactory to the community. And I've been very proud to be a member of that bench. You know, I, something I've learned recently is that the Canadian criminal code is federal, that the, the provinces uh, implement it on behalf of the federal government, but unlike in the United States, which is where I come from, and uh, and, you know, except for my junior high and high school years in Winnipeg, which, you know, there I, my concerns were things that teenagers would be concerned about, uh, rather than uh, the legal system in which you live. Um, I, I find that to, to be fascinating. Um, can, can you help um, myself as well as people that might not be familiar with um, the intricacies of that kind of system? Of, of what that means from a practical perspective of uh, the federal, the, the criminal code being federal, but administered by, by provincial, by the provinces um, and, and how that, um, you know, what are the, the pros and the cons, I suppose, uh, of that kind of system? Well, the advantages of course is that with the federal government, um, um, in charge of the criminal law, it's consistent across the country. Um, the provinces administer, as you say, by setting up the courthouses, appointing the uh, court officials, the judges, crown attorneys, um, but it gives a consistency to the application of the law so that if you commit a robbery in Ontario compared to a robbery in Alberta, uh, the same law applies to you. Now, it's interesting that you raise that because when I went to the uh, week-long educational conference uh, that was uh, a requirement for newly appointed judges, and it was a very intense program. This wasn't just a getaway. It was working from 9 in the morning until 4.30 uh, every day for five days and having... Um, speakers and, and um, panels and uh, discussion groups about a variety of areas of the law, it was posed to us a particular, uh, set, uh, particular sentencing decision that had to be made. And they asked us each to say what we would do based on those facts. The East Coast had a certain approach Quebec, another approach, Ontario, another approach. Alberta was the toughest of them all. 
and British Columbia was similar to Ontario. It was almost at a point where someone said, if you're gonna commit a crime in Alberta, you're better to fly over to British Columbia, otherwise the sentence could be significantly higher. So each province determines how they administer the law, but the law is determined nationally. And in fact, um, uh, Prime Minister Harper was very instrumental in having an impact on minimum sentences that created some concern with respect to minimizing discretion that a judge would have. Uh, but again, it all came from Ottawa. So that, that was my follow-up question. So are there sentencing guidelines um, that, uh, that at least provides a, a more level playing field for, for uh, um, implications of breaking the law across different provinces, even though it might be the same law? Many, many um, charges have minimum sentences or maximum sentences. In terms of finding the appropriate range, you would look to the offense itself, the circumstances under which it was committed. You would always ask for the antecedents of the accused. You would want to know whether he had a prior criminal record, a similar criminal record, whether he uh, was making a meaningful contribution to society, whether there were mental health issues, whether he required assistance through probationary terms. Uh, it was always important for me to learn more about the individual before coming to a conclusion as to the appropriate sentence. And you would always look to other case law to see how they dealt with similar situations to assist you in determining the appropriate sentence. So I can hear in that answer the importance of your attention to detail, uh, something that you pride yourself on, because uh, you would need you would need to pay attention to all those details in order to to make a decision um, that was just. Um, as you know, in our Jewish tradition, when we talk about justice, we quote Deuteronomy, "Tzedek tzedek tirdof," justice, justice you shall pursue, which is the most common interpretation of the repetition of the word justice is justice by just means show you pursue. And that's where you'll those- find that, You'll from. find that quote at the very beginning of my no. book. I guess you will. <laughs> uh, what, what was your purpose in writing this memoir? What did you hope to accomplish? Well, to be frank, I never intended to write a book. Um, but in conversation with friends, with colleagues, I continuously got the impression that they were saying, I'm a storyteller and I'm good at telling stories and maybe you should record them. And I just let it pass by me. And then all of a sudden something came along. It was called COVID, uh, which reminds me, Ein Ra Belitov, out of every bad situation comes some good. And the good that came here was the opportunity for me to reminisce and to reconnect with former associates, with clients, and to write a book. And so that's when I started to sit down. And it was in March of 2020 that I began to formulate uh, the process for writing a book. And, and what did you hope to achieve in telling these stories? It would be a legacy for my children and grandchildren to know what their Zaidi or what their father and their Zaidi did throughout his career, both as a lawyer and as a judge. And, you know, there were stories that I would tell my grandchildren when they were young and they'd say, Zaidi, I want to hear that story again. I want to hear that story again. Uh, there's one, many, of course, about my Hebrew school days, which could be a sequel to this book. That would certainly take up another complete book, but they enjoyed these stories. And so I thought this is one way of recording it. I've given them each a copy of the book and that will be a memory for them. And I think also as they go through it, um, your emphasis and reflections on the strategies and the values that you brought to bear in each of these cases. Um, and clearly, as you've demonstrated in our conversation today, Jack, um, are also deeply embedded in Jewish values, 
uh, your command of, of, of text um, as a natural part of who you are is one of the reasons why I love being at Betsetic, um, because we have um, so many people like you uh, that are are so educated and who for whom Jewish values are, are not something that exists out there, but something may I love from the heart uh, that uh, goes forward. Um, I know that uh, you're tying uh, some of the sales of the book uh, to Sadaka Project, uh, to um, helping the synagogue and to helping uh, scholarships for those in need. Uh, why don't you tell us um, what you what you're doing? And, um, and why you're doing it. You know, Rabbi, I'm going to do that, but you just said something that touches me um, when you talk about from the heart. I've already received some very warm and lovely compliments on the book. I could feel the sincerity, um, which makes me think, you know, uh, that words which come from the heart enter the heart and these words certainly have entered mine and that's part of what helps me to feel encouraged about uh, asking others to buy the book now of course they can get it at bookstores um, indigo at first canadian place or book city at young and st Clair. Coles up at Fairview, it's on Amazon. But for those who are interested in purchasing the book, I'm going to urge them to very seriously consider sending a knee transfer to decisions at rogers.com. That's the email address, decisions at rogers.com. Just mention Beth Sedek. And they don't need a uh, security question, it's direct. The minute that happens, there will be a book available for them to pick up at the Shul office. The Shul is not handling any payments. It has to be by e-transfer to decisions at rogers.com. And for every book that is picked up at the Shul office, part of the proceeds of that book will be uh, donated to the Howard High Cooper Trust Fund for higher Jewish education in tribute to my late uncle, Hi Cooper. So it's decisions at rogers.com. And uh, I'd be delighted uh, to make that donation in his honor. Uh, mitzvah, gorer, mitzvah, one mitzvah leads to another. Um, last word, Jack. Last word, um, they've asked me what my second book would be. I already had an invitation from a past president of Beth Sedek. He said, you wrote about your memories as a lawyer and a judge. If you will write your next book on your memories, <laughs> on your memories as a shul president at Beth Sedek, I'll buy 50 copies. Yeah, well, we want to keep those secret. <laughs> <laughs> a reserve on that invitation. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As, uh, uh, as Jack said, uh, if you want to purchase a book and help those seeking higher education with an emphasis on Jewish learning, you can do so by purchasing the book at decisions at rogers.com and pick up your book from the Beth Sedek office. To find out what's happening at Beth Sedek, www.beth-tzedek.org. We hope you'll join us often as we continue to seek to inspire and enable our community to live meaningful Jewish lives. This, of course, is one of the ways in which we do that. Uh, Jack, thank you again. I look forward to seeing you and Sandy in the very near future. I want to thank everyone for joining us and I wish you a Shavuot Tov, a good week. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>